Yeah, Sardis is freaking frustrating. That's, that's me talking to Sardis. That's me. That's Sardis. Look at him. Knows everything. Can't tell him anything. Show it to him in the Bible. No, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. But that's me. Maybe you've had better luck. Did you have better luck, sir? No. Now, that brother did not have better luck talking to Sardis. Matter of fact, that brother looks like he went on a bender. I think he went on a bender afterwards. What about you? Did you? No. Did you have better luck with, with Sardis? No. How about you? No. You? No. No, Sardis is frustrating. Sardis is frustrating. But we should have known that because it's built into their character. According to the Lord, they think they're alive, but they're dead. They have the reputation of being alive, and you better believe they're living on that reputation, but they're dead. Good news for Sardis, you can come awake. You can come back alive, because he said you could. If you won't wake up, which means you can wake up, Still hope for them. The problem with Sardis is they don't know they're Sardis. You can't convince them of it. Oh, we're not Sardis. Are you you kidding me? Please. Yeah. So it's frustrating. We knew going in it's going to be frustrating, and it is. Before I continue with what I really want to talk about, a couple things real quick. I want to thank a viewer, uh, not sure, 1582, I believe was uh, their handle. Uh, said a verse that is very supportive of the white horse rider being the church. It's out of 1 John 5. Really a good find. Listen to this. Now, he's going to be using the word, the Greek word, nekao, which is also ascribed to the rider on the white horse twice. Listen to these verses. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes. Nekao overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome, nakao, the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes, nakaos? Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, this is John, who is probably also, I believe, the writer, and many, many, many other people as well, the writer of the book of Revelation. This may have, 1 John may have been written after Revelation. There's a, there's a more than decent chance that's true. So he would have already written about the white horse rider and the word nakao being attached to it by the Holy Spirit. And he gives us these verses. Who is it that overcomes? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Whether or not John is the writer of both, books, I believe he is, but even if it's proven that he wasn't, it's the Holy Spirit who's telling us this. First John is one of the last books you'll read before you get to Revelation. If you take this information into the book of Revelation, you're going to know who the rider on the white horse is. It's not evil, because who is the one that overcomes but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? White horse rider is the church. But if you're from Sardis, No, no, you're wrong, sir. You're wrong, sir. The other thing I want to mention real quick on a slightly different subject, but it's related. Uh, Occasionally, on one of the alternative news sites that I go to, they'll publish a a short video from another YouTube channel called Suspicious Observers. It's a science-based channel. Very intelligent guy runs it. Not a believer. Not a believer. He says he's, you know, guy open. He hasn't closed the door on it. But he is concerned that a catastrophic event is coming on the earth based on some scientific things that he has uncovered. He was pointing out last week that we have had more intrusions of the northern lights into the southern hemisphere this year than ever. Than ever. We've had six occasions. Usually, he said, you get about one or two a decade. We've had six. And what's really mind-blowing about that is normally when it, you know, it gets as far south as like the southern states in the United States or even further south, it's because the sun really had an event. 
and the geomagnetic field was just unable to dispense all of it. And so it, it kind of penetrates through the G. I'm, of course, doing a layman's expl explanation of this. A G, the geomagnetic field allows more of it in, and that's why we get it. A big event on the sun translates into a bigger exposure of the northern lights. But that hasn't been happening. These incursions this year into the southern hemisphere have come when the sun is just a little above normal. Normally, that wouldn't even be an event. And what he's saying is... The geomagnetic field is at the weakest, maybe ever, or since the last time we've had a catastrophic event that includes a pole change, a pole shift. Yeah, uh, listen. Uh, the, when when a scientific situation like who tells us follow the science? The powers that be are constantly telling us, no, you know, Christians and religious freaks follow the science. Well, here's some science, and they're not following it. No one's talking about it. I mentioned that to my barber, who's a Christian, and she said, well, they may not be talking about it because they're probably the ones that are causing the weakening of the geomagnetic field. Hadn't thought of that. Point is, anything's possible. I do not believe that's a coincidence at this particular time that the geomagnetic field is dangerously weak. Uh, I won't be surprised if that plays a role. The point is, we have so many things to watch for right now. I mean, we are in a high watch time with political events. We're looking for that next sign. Yeah, that one right there. I don't know if it's figurative or literal or alluding to Isaiah 17, but we're watching all of that. And yet, when you walk into your church on Sunday, it's like none of this is going on. It's like, are you, it's like they show no sign that they understand that we are in a very surreal time in human history. It's lost on them. I remember growing up, when I grew up in the 50s and 60s, you still got, believe me, a truckload of World War II movies. That's what you're going to watch on TV and in the movies. And I remember one where, it, I can't remember exactly, it was a guy, who was American, who was over in Europe fighting gets lost from his company or his unit. They've had some sort of, you know, a, a combat and he wakes up. He's not sure where he is. He's trying to find, rambles around in the, the valleys and hills of Europe somewhere. And he stumbles upon a farmhouse and they all, the family there sees that he's been injured and they get him food and a bandaid around his head. And he slowly through broken English talking with them realizes they don't know World War II is happening. They don't know they're just a few miles from it. It's coming their way. They're completely oblivious. That's the church. That's the church. All of this stuff going on. And you go to your church, and they sing a couple of songs, the senior pastor comes bounding out on stage like everything is fine. It's a glorious day. I want to thank everybody for being here at the First Church of Oblivion. Uh, if this is your first time, would you take the time to fill out our, our visitor's card? We just want to send you a little thank you. We're not going to put any pressure on you. You're our guest. We want to take care of you today. And, uh, you know, off and on, he's going to give you a nice prepared little uh, sermon, a couple more songs, a little offering, and then an extra long prayer, a needlessly long prayer at the very end, and you're done. And then you go back into reality, and it's totally different. That's Sardis for you, folks. And they're tough to deal with, and they won't change. Those of you who have not turned back to the Olivet Discourse, the reason you haven't is they taught it out of you. They knocked it out of you with their worthless teaching. You're talking about the church who doesn't even realize we're in the tribulation and have been for nearly 2,000 years. I'm not coming up with that. Jesus said it in the Olivet Discourse. When you see the army surrounding Jerusalem and it's about to come down, then there will be great tribulation unlike anything that's ever happened. And that tribulation continues. And then he says right before his coming, immediately after the tribulation of those days. He's not saying the tribulation ends. It's going to continue on. What he's saying, those days are coming to an end. Those days, the church age is a, a huge event is about to happen in the middle of this tribulation period. That's why it's immediately followed by the sun will not give its light, the moon turns to blood, and all of that, because something strange is happening. There's war in heaven. 
Satan is being cast out of earth. The Lord is going to appear and take his church. And then it continues on. The world was Satan without any access to the heavens or the air, confined to the earth, and all kinds of things are going to happen. Church sees the tribulation as hasn't even started yet. And you can't convince them otherwise, even when you show them that's what Jesus said. I was talking to one of my sisters, for instance, not my friend, it's Crazy Carolyn. I'm not saying Crazy Carolyn is part of the Sardis Church, but I was trying to explain to her that we're in the tribulation, and she was like, no, tribulation future. I said, well, do you believe that Jesus was talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the Olivet Discourse? Yeah, I believe that. Well, look what he says. The tribulation began back then. She looked at it and went, tribulation future. I said, look, look. He says, after, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's when he's showing up for the church. And she looked at it and went, tribulation future. That's what she's taught. She got so flustered, she finally just threw back her head and started screeching like a bird. Ah! Yeah, yeah, like that, for like 10 minutes. She couldn't handle it. Now, I don't think she's from Sardis. No, she's not from Sardis. She's a nice lady, and she'll get it. But Sardis won't. Sardis will not. You can't teach them. War in heaven, folks, it is such an important thing in the book of Revelation and in the Olivet Discourse, and the church has turned their back on it. You'll never hear it mentioned because they're unaware of it. They don't want to be aware of it. It won't fit their narrative. Here's what I wish had happened. Here's my ideal scenario. I wish when we came into the faith, which would have been December 2007 for me, that's when the Lord reached down into the sewer I was living in and pulled me out, hosed me off, and made me a new person in Him, forgiven, washed in the blood of the Lord, all glory to the Father for sending the Son. Who would have done that for me? Only He. You may have come in to the to the church, to the faith, similarly or differently, but you came in, and I wish when we all did, the church was still in the fact-finding phase of eschatology. When you and I came in, we were given a prefabricated school of thought. Here, we're pre-trib, or here, we're some other school of thought. Oh, okay, all right, and here's how we got there. Here's what, here's what it, it consists of. This is now yours. And, you know, like me, you may have kicked the tires on some other, you know, schools of thought and everything, but you kind of settle on the one they gave you, and okay, that's it. I wish they hadn't reached that point. They were still in the fact-finding phase, like a, a crime investigation before it goes to the DA. They're just getting the facts, getting the facts. Wouldn't that have been great? The church doesn't have a scenario in their mind. They don't have a narrative that they're trying to get you to believe. They're trying to find the truth. And let's say in my perfect scenario that they have at that point already discovered that war in heaven is big. It's big in Revelation and it's big at the Olivet Discourse. They understand that stars falling from heaven are in fact Satan and the angels. That's the result of war in heaven. So they got that part of it right. This would have been so helpful to you and me and the church. So you go to church, and your pastor's talking about, yeah, I just came back from a convention. We're continuing on. We know that war in heaven is important, that if we can just figure out where that happens in the great timeline, then we can start adding events behind it or in front of it, or maybe it's the end. Who knows? But if we know that if we can kind of hone in on war in heaven, we'll really have something. But we're going to keep looking because it's a big deal to Jesus at the Olivet Discourse, so we know it's a big deal. We're just trying to figure it all out. Then later he comes to back to the church, had some more discussions with fellow theologians, and he says, well, you know, what's kind of interesting is that we're seeing that when Jesus talks about the war in heaven, it's very similar to the events at the sixth seal, where war in heaven also shows up. It's different in chapter 12 when it's really fully discussed and you get the most information in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, seems a little different. Now, now we know there's only going to be one war in heaven. Listen, we, we all agree on that. That's the only thing that makes sense. But we're trying to figure out why we see it in chapter 6 and the sixth seal. The sixth seal continues into chapter 7, and then there's like chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, 
And then we're back at war in heaven in chapter 12, when we're trying to figure out, well, why is that? What is it that we're not seeing about the structure of the book of Revelation? Because at the sixth seal, the war in heaven kind of brings about what appears to be an ending. There's this big group of people from all nations, which certainly looks like the church, certainly looks like the church. And we're told that God will dry all their tears and that the lamb will lead them to living waters and that that crowd will serve him day and night in his glorious who knows how big temple. And everything is fine. It's kind of the Bible's version of, and they lived happily ever after. It's, it looks like an ending. And I kind of thought it was the ending ending, says your pastor, who's looking for the facts, trying to come to the truth of the book of Revelation and the Olivet Discourse. But in chapter 12, Satan gets thrown down at war in heaven, and, they, and he continues on. So it's an ending there, and it's a continuation in chapter 12. And so we're trying to figure out, well, why is that? But we're going to keep looking into it. A little while later, he comes back and he says, look, we were at a seminar and a guy said, you know what I think may be happening? Because I took a lot of English lit in college and a lot of novels do this thing where they start off focused on one character and a big event happens and suddenly they switch, maybe go back in time and another character we see about his life or her life. And she runs into that same big event that the first character did. The, the book shifts point of view. Is maybe that's what's happening in the book of Revelation, that we're switching a point of view, that, that the sixth seal is the ending of a story, perhaps. Perhaps it's the church story. And we'll look into that, because it is. And so maybe it is leading up in that particular part of Revelation to the war in heaven that brings a, a point to the end of the church age. And then in chapter 12, it's showing us that it also will bring a beginning of another phase here on earth where the earth is warned. Look out, devil's coming down to you. He's full of wrath and he knows he has just a little time left. And he goes forth and does what he does, brings out the, the beast from the sea, the false prophet, 666, and eventually ends up going to Armageddon, losing that. And then the end comes. So maybe that's another point of view, another kind of a storyline that's different than the first storyline. And maybe those chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 are another storyline. They are. God's line. But they would have begun to see the structure, and the structure is this. War in heaven does end the church age, and its backstory is back that way. Seals 1 through 5. But then comes another point of view in chapter 12. What happens to Satan after he gets thrown to earth? God has purged him from heaven, and really the storyline is what Satan does and how God purges him from the earth, and that storyline moves forward. Six Seal is looking back on the backstory. Chapter 12 is looking forward on to the final phase. If we had that when we first entered the faith, we would have been so much closer to the truth. There's a lot more there, of course. But if this structure that you're looking at right here is truth, it is truth. It's not because it came out of my head. It did not. It comes straight out of the Bible. It is truth. If what your eschatology is made up of won't allow for that truth, your eschatology is wrong. That is truth that you're looking at straight out of the book of Revelation. If you're not from Sardis, you will at least consider it. If you're from Sardis, you'll go, no, no, that's not what I was taught. No. No, no thank you. I'll pass. And so wouldn't it be great if the church understood this, that we are barreling toward this important moment, war in heaven that is so enormous, it ends a phase and begins another. Tribulation has been going on. It will continue until the second coming. But at war in heaven, he does make an appearance. He doesn't set down his feet on earth, but he is coming for one reason, gather the church. Such an important moment. If the church saw this, you wouldn't be able to go to church on Sunday without them mentioning, stay ready, folks, stay ready. We've already seen the Revelation 12 sign, which they've now passed on, of course. We know we're in that time zone. We are in the correct time zone. Stay ready. Be ready for anything. Let's keep an eye on the signs that he told us about. But they're not. But they're not. Because you can't convince Sardis that they're Sardis and they're dead. 
and they need to wake up. Last thing I'll say about War in Heaven in this particular episode is this. It's kind of an interesting idea. We'll see how it plays out. If there, When War in Heaven comes, it will precede, of course, the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ for the church. Somebody left a comment saying, oh no, War in Heaven is after. That's because you've disregarded the Olivet Discourse. If you fact-checked everything you're told with the Olivet Discourse, you, you wouldn't be saying stupid stuff like that. You would be going, oh, no, that's not what Jesus says, so I need to change what I thought I knew. Fact check it through the Olivet Discourse because you trust the Lord. Not to trust and listen to the Lord and be a Christian? Come on. It's ridiculous. But when war in heaven comes, that means Satan and his angels who have set up this hierarchy of temptation and misery for everybody on the planet, going after everyone, including Christians, that's why we're supposed to put on the full armor of God, because they're constantly attacking us and non-Christians as well, making sure they stay far away from the gospel. They're going to be busy with war in heaven. I mean, their survival depends on it. Does that mean during war in heaven, there might be a little more clarity here on earth without all of the temptation from Satan and his third of the angels spending their times doing nothing but accusing us and tempting us? Wouldn't that be something if there's just at the very end a little more clarity? I'm going to test it. I'm going to find somebody that I know voted for Joe Biden, and I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to go, are you still glad you voted for Joe Biden? And if they go, oh yeah, I'd vote for him again, then I'll realize no war in heaven hasn't started because you have no clarity yet. But if I go up to him and I go, are you, are you still glad you voted for Joe Biden? You know, I don't know what I was thinking. No, I wouldn't vote for Joe. I don't know why. I, then I'd go, with war in heaven. I'll run around, war in heaven. It could be amazing. We'll see. But we're entering into something that we don't know. We see it's coming, but we don't really know. We kind of know, but we don't really know. And wouldn't it be so helpful if the church was bolstering us? Every time you went to church, you heard more and more about it. That becomes contagious. But that's not the case, and so we make do. You're going to have to do it on your own. You're going to have to fight through the nonchalance of the church to get to the truth. In the next episode, this is my plan. A lot of times my plan falls apart and something else comes up, but my plan right now is I want to talk about this verse because we're talking about the Olivet Discourse. This very controversial verse is in that particular section of the Bible and once again, the church has no clue what this is all about. I want to talk about that in our next episode, if there is a next episode, because war in heaven is imminent. God bless you, brothers and sisters.